In view of the importance attached in his district to the woman's father because of his favorable attitude to Germany, Eichmann's personal answer was, I quote, after examining the matter, I regretfully find that because of consideration of principle, I'm unable to permit the stateless Jew Michaelis to leave for Switzerland. We shall present to the court many such examples. We shall prove that he dealt with both the community and the individual, with every concentration of Jews and every individual Jew with whom he came to be concerned, and always one goal, death. When the Germans sought a man to serve as French Commissar for Jewish Affairs in Laval's government, Eichmann was asked, about the candidacy of Dupatie de Clan. Eichmann's office answered that the man seemed to him most suitable for the job since his father was the French officer who had once arrested Dreyfus. The Swedish foreign minister sought to save 30 Norwegian Jews born in Sweden by granting them Swedish citizenship. They too are human, those unfortunates, the representatives of the Swedish embassy in Oslo explained to the Gestapo. Eichmann's answer was, I quote, These efforts should be frustrated, and I intend to turn those Jews as soon as possible and without taking into consideration the framework of general Jewish activities. When he learned that a Swiss priest had published a book containing accounts of the fate of the Jews in the French deputation camp, he issued instructions that the priest should henceforth be kept away from them. We shall show in this trial how much attention and care Eichmann devoted to closing every breach through which it might have been possible for any single Jew to slip through the net. Typical was his handling of an urgent application of the Foreign Office on May 26, 1943, with reference to Mario Sasson of Zagreb, married to a Christian German woman, with three brothers serving in the German army on the Eastern Front, who had been sent to Auschwitz. <coughs> in view of the desperate situation of the woman, Eichmann was asked to transfer Sasson to Germany and enable him to be reunited with his family. Eichmann delayed his answer a long while until his office wanted, was in a position to reply that Sasson was no longer alive. When his envoy in France, Danica, encountered difficulties in getting trains for a transport to Auschwitz, a personal application Eichmann was enough to get the matter arranged. In 1944, what was being done to the Jews in the area of Germany was already known in Europe. A number of Jews imprisoned in the West Bolt camp in Holland 
had received through the efforts of relatives and friends in Switzerland passports of Honduras, Honduras Peru, San Salvador, and other countries which gave them the right to leave Europe. On the order of the accused, these passports were held up, but the question remained how to explain to the Swiss authorities the fact that registered letters sent from that country had not reached their destination. The Swiss Church even demanded compensation. The Church issued an order. The German Church will notify the Swiss Church that the letters were lost because of enemy action. The letters should not be returned and no compensation should be paid for their loss. At times we shall see the accused and his section even stepping out of the framework of strict camouflage and speaking frankly about the extermination, at least to the extent of internal exchanges within government circles. To the assistant director general of the foreign ministry, Luther, who had drawn his attention to complaints received about steps taken against Jews, the office of the accused wrote an answer. Quote, where wood is being chopped, splinters will fall. The enemy will always try to exaggerate the measures used against him in order simply to awaken pity and with the hope that they will be discontinued. Ever since we have begun to intensify our measures against the Jewish enemy, he has been trying by means of anonymous letters to practically all institutions of the right to escape the fate he deserves. Unquote. It is hardly necessary to mention that this Jewish enemy was a defenseless civil population including infants, children, women, and old men. We shall see, and the fate in store for them was murder. We shall see how Eichmann continued with the German diplomats themselves and the various authorities in the occupied zone who did not operate or do everything he wanted. We shall see his anger at Italian officials, who on many occasions frustrated his plans. We shall also see the fact that Denmark, through a noble and dangerous operation, has smuggled her Jews to Sweden. It has struggled with all the governments of the occupied countries to make them cooperate in his work. When the Pope himself interceded for the Jews of Rome, who were arrested practically underneath the Vatican window who had been ordered to deny the origins and pretend to be Christians. They saw their fathers being left with whips before their eyes. In front of them, this passion would be carried on by the German executions as to who would be killed first, the father or the son, who went to the earth and prayed with tear of Israel on their lips. These children and youths, who despite all the desperate measures and consumers would finally fall into the hands of the hunters, they are the very soul and innermost core of the indictment. Both Anne Frank, St. Justin Jungers and a million others, those unplanned presses of radiant youth and hope for life and achievement, they were the future of the Jewish people. He that destroyed them was seeking to destroy the Jewish people. We shall present the picture of some of those children. Rolling with hunger, lightened and crushed, without frozen with terror. We shall show you the photographs of their past bodies thrown into Mignola and Zevel. 
It's of the help of people running from the threshold of the extermination chambers. Perhaps we should succeed in painting a pale and inadequate picture of the calamity wide as the ocean that overtook the house of Israel. It is no wonder that the German German foreign minister Tantan Tantan sent information, the warning broadcast by London Radio, that those responsible for the murders murders in Auschwitz would be brought to judgment. Even on the verge of the German collapse in April 1945, in that atmosphere of the twilight of the dark, when the Allies from the East and West and South were closing in. Eichmann still told the German Red Cross man that he could not agree to the more humanitarian methods of dealing with Jews then being considered by Himmler. Is it any wonder then that one of those days he said to a close assistant that he would be ready to commit suicide and he would gladly leap into his grave after he had succeeded in exterminating five million Jews? And this too he may be followed in the footsteps of his master Hitler who also said that he would die happy with the knowledge of Germany's great achievement and her contribution to history. Many millions of non-Jews also perished in the Great War. We shall not attempt to decide here at this trial which of the acts of hostility were permissible and which were forbidden by the rules of war laid down by international law. But we shall say with all the emphasis at our command that the extermination of the Jewish people was not connected with any military action. It cannot be compared with the bombing of cities, These were acts of war. And whether they were legitimate or not, is a question which we shall not attempt to decide here. They were carried out in connection with and in the process of waging war. Extermination was carried out at the time of the war. The battle smoke to some extent covered and concealed the atrocities. But it was not done in pursuit of war. Nor was it impelled by war need. This was a separate and special action in itself which could be implemented more easily, more conveniently with less intervention from internal or external elements during the war. Thank you very much. 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 We should nowhere find it stated that the thing was being done in order to advance military operations. Quite the contrary. If there were some Nazi leaders or their henchmen who wanted to postpone the final solution to the war, they did so on the ground of the need to exploit Jewish labor power in wartime. We shall present proofs of this contention, and at this stage, I shall mention one piece of evidence. When the German army invaded the Soviet Union, instructions were given for the immediate destruction of the Jews by the special mission groups. We shall see later in the sequel how these orders were carried out. In report number 81, of the Einsatzgruppen, dated September 12, 1941, we read the following. <laughs> One should note as an exceptional phenomenon the discovery of Jewish kolkhoz, collective farms. Between Krivoyrog and Dnepropetrovsk there are Jewish kolkhoz, in which not only the directors but also all the labor power is Jewish. These are, as far as we can see, not very intelligent Jews, who have therefore been transferred by the political leadership to farm labor. Einsatz Commando 6 has decided, in this case, not to shoot these Jews, 
in order to enable them to continue working. And they contented themselves with liquidating the Jewish management and replacing it with a Ukrainian one. Unquote. We see that for the sake of the war effort, the special mission group departed from their orders and left a few Jews alive. But this is not all. Means of transport were a decisive importance for the German war effort, especially when the front extended in the east part of the west. When the army needed every locomotive and railway car, and there was a severe shortage of transport, trains were still found for shipments to the extermination centers. While the front was trying out for manpower, the units needed for the work of annihilation were found. The extermination program was secret for a variety of reasons. First, in order to delude the victims themselves and make them believe that they were merely being brought to labor camps. We shall see later how many ingenious devices the Nazis used to camouflage the gas vans as dwelling places. To erect the Shan railway station in Treblinka so that it would seem to be merely a transit point. But even at the gates of Auschwitz they inscribed, Arbeit macht frei, that is, labor liberates. To facilitate the camouflage, prisoners in the camps were ordered to write postcards to their relatives saying that they were well, and the postcards would arrive after their writers had long been consumed by the flames. And the device, of course, for the purpose of momentarily allaying apprehensions, fostering illusions, and dampening the will to rebel, because it seemed to indicate that the deportees were still alive, and the horrible stories about extermination were perhaps not true. Secondly, the camouflage was needed to hide what was happening from the eyes of the world. This is why the Führer commanded that everything related to these activities be kept a secret. No one should know more than what he had to know to do his job. And all the necessary instructions should be transmitted only very close to the actual implementation. The German military command ordered that the expression transportation to transport labor should be used instead of transfer to the east or deportation. In the Gestapo itself, an atmosphere of secrecy and camouflage prevailed. But the secret, of course, could not be kept inviolate very long. Especially after the circle of conspirators, planners, executors, and others concerned widened as the circles of extermination spread ever wider. Not only do the thousands in the Einsatz group know about it, but also the letter carriers who had to return mail stamped address unknown. The clerks and registration officers who had to cross the deportees' names off their books. There were thousands of soldiers on leave from all the fronts. So that finally, one way or another, the knowledge reached many millions, many millions of the German people. From Eichmann himself, we shall hear that at first there were instructions to use camouflage Tarnung, and the fact of extermination was kept a strict state secret. I know only, he says, that towards the end, in 43, to use a somewhat exaggerated expression, the sparrows were already chirping this from the rooftop. In a long speech of encouragement and praise delivered by Himmler to SS officers in Poznan on October 4, 1943, while expressing the truth and commendation for the courage 
גדולת האופי, ושאר סגולות העיקר של אנשיו, הוא אמר, אני מצטט, כאן אדבר לגמרי גלויות על פרק קשה במיוחד. איננו נדבר על כך גלויות, אף כי בפומבי לא נעשה זאת לעולם. אני מתכוון לגירוש היהודים, להשמדת העם היהודי. זה קל לומר, אך רק כמה מהנמצאים כאן ידעו מה פשר הדבר שמונחות ירדיו מהגוויות, 500 גוויות, 1,000 גוויות מונחות זו לעשות. לעמוד בכל אלה ולהישאר הגונים, זה הקשה אופנינו. זהו דף תהילה של ההיסטוריה שלנו, אשר מעולם לא נכתב ולעולם לא ייכתב. עד כאן האנושי. וכך ראה מנהיג העם הגרמני את גדולת עמו, שראוי בכל זאת להצניע ולהחזיקה בסוד. בינתיים נתגלה. מה שהנבלים הללו התגאו בו, אינו אלא חרפת עולם. מה שהם עשו בסוד, בתקווה כי הרצח הגדול ביותר בהיסטוריה יישאר סוד סמוס, כל זה יסופר כאן בגלוי, יתגלה ויוקע לעין השמש. ואתה נעקוב אחרי פועל הדמים של אדולף אייכמן בארצות השונות בהן עבר המשטר הנאצי בשבט זה. פולין הייתה המדינה הראשונה אשר פעמה את פעמו המר של קרב הבזק הגרמני כאשר מיליון וחצי חיילים חדשים ונבחר כלי המשחית מוגנים על ידי מטרייה ענקית של מטוסי קרב מצוינים בכל אמצעי הקשר המודרני הסתערו על המדינה עם פרוץ מלחמת העולם השנייה פולין הייתה תנועת נפשם של הנאצים היא הייתה ירידת חוזה השלום עם ורסאי שהם ראו בו חרפה לגרמני היא חצתה בין רוסיה המזרחית והמערבית It separated East and West Prussia and it controlled Dante. These facts were featured in the campaign of incitement conducted by the Nazis while they were fighting for power. Against the idea that Germany might accept the consequences of a defeat in World War I. After coming to power, Hitler succeeded in misleading the Polish statesmen of the day who fell unsuspectingly into his trap. As far back as 1934, he managed to drive a wedge between Poland and France by enacting a Polish sign and an aggression treaty and while he was busy making conquests without war in other places, he led them to believe that he saw peace. This situation did not last long, however, and the Teutonic fury was directed against Poland in the lightning invasion of September the 1st, 1939. Nazi race doctrine regarded the Slav peoples as inferior beings whose historic destiny was to serve higher and nobler peoples. It was therefore the declared aim of Nazi policy to subjugate the Polish people and never to allow it to recover. But after the conquest, Hitler told France, the right governor general of Poland, I quote, the government general will serve only as a reservoir of manual labor. Workers required by the Reich will be brought from the government general. There will be only one master for the Poles, 
the Germans, and therefore all the representatives of the Polish intelligentsia are to be destroyed. We shall see to it that the Poles do not die of hunger and so forth, but they must not reach any higher level. If once the Poles reach a higher level of development, they will cease to be the man powers of war which we need. A humble German worker or farmer must always be at least 10% higher than any Pole. Unquote. If this was the attitude of the Germans to the dominant part of the population, their attitude to the Jews of Poland was immeasurably worse. They were simply abundant to their fate. If so far there were any divisions of opinion between the government and the Reich Hall, on the attitude to be adopted towards the Polish Jews, they related solely to the choice of the appropriate date for their extermination. While Frank tried to carry out the Christmas government of the corridor to the Reich by supplying labor, manufacturing ammunition, food and other commodities, and destroying the Jews only after they had contributed their sweat and manpower to the German industry. Orders came from Berlin to exterminate them, and besides the Gestapo machine acted on its own responsibility without coordination with or regard for the government general. This aroused Frank's anger to fever pitch. We have in our possession from Stalin, which contains minutes of meetings of his administration and notes from his speeches. I shall quote a few extracts from this document. In the meeting held on December 9, 1942, Frank complained that the Jewish labor force was being taken away from him. And it is obvious that they are making our work very difficult. If in the middle of this war work, an order comes to send all Jews to exterminate them. But this order comes from above. The order to exterminate Jews comes from higher levels. Taking the Jews away has caused immense difficulties in the labor field. Now the order comes to take the Jews out of the munitions factory. Let us not delude ourselves that Frank wanted to save the Jews from their doom. A year earlier he had said at a meeting of his government, as far as the Jews are concerned, this I wanted to say openly. They must be finished off in one way or another. There is criticism of many measures of pressing being employed in the Reich against the Jews. There is talk of atrocities, brutalities, etc. I must ask you first to agree with me before I go any further on one point. We shall have sympathy for the German people alone and not for anyone else in the world. As a veteran national socialist, I have to say that if the Jewish community in Europe survives the war after we have sacrificed our dearest blood to hold Europe, then we shall have achieved only partial success in this war. I have therefore basically only one expectation of the Jews, that they shall disappear. Unquote. However, differences of opinion as to the method of their disappearance. Frank from time to time, Frank asked the Gestapo to leave him at least the skilled workers, and not to send them to the kill. But generally, the Gestapo paid no attention to his request, and they killed him and his accomplices, and went ahead with the destruction of the Jewish community in Eastern Europe. Frank complained bitterly that the Gestapo was acting independently in the area under his rule, and creating a state within a state. We have established in the Reich a plethora of authorities which are actively engaged in warring one against the other. Paul reached the point where Frank submitted his resignation on May 1943, but Hitler did not accept it. By then, the greater part of the Polish jury had been destroyed, and internal occupier struggles brought no deliverance whatsoever to the Jews. 
וכאשר אחרם של אחרוני יהודי פולין נגבר בגבעות החול של אושוויץ, אמר פרנק, אני מצטט, התחלנו פה בשלושה וחצי מיליון יהודים, מהם נותרו עוד חכים במחנות העבודה. יתרם, נאמר כך, הגרו. הפרוטוקול מוסיף כי בין הנוכחים השתררה עליצות כללית לשם התיאור זה של מלאכת רצח היהודים לא נעשתה בידי פרנק. כבר שמענו את ראש ממשלתו ביולר מכריז ומודיע בוועידת ואנזי כי עניין זה שייך גם מחנות ההשמדה לא היו בסמכותו של פרנק ואף דבר זה נאמר במפורש באותה ישיבות. אני מצטט מחנות אלה הוקמו במישרים על ידי האס אס מברלין, משם נוהלו, ולגבי כל המתרחש בהם, אך לאי המרכז בברלין. ואומנם כך היה, ועוד נקבל ראיות על כך גם מפייחם. פולין החל סבלם של היהודים עם כניסה חזרה. פוגרומים, התעללות, השפלה, שריפת בתי כנסת, גזל רכוש, קנסות קיבוציים, כל אלה היו מנחם דעה של היחידה הפולנית הכבושה מיד עם כניסת הצבא. אלפים נפלו קורבן כבר בשבועות הראשונים בכל המיטות המשונות שבעולם. את יהודי ירוסווה הביאו לגדות הנהר סם והביאו מאות יהודי ביטגוש, ברומברג, ערכו בהם טבח. ווג'נרח פוגרום בוטרו של גבוש. ואחר כך מאסר מתפקדים יהודים, פגיעתם לחתום הצהרה כי הם מבצעי השריפה, ועל יסוד הצהרה זו קופה, הטלת קנס של 100 אלף יהודים על יהודי העיר ועד השריפה. במשך כמה שבועות הוצתו או פוצצו ונאבקו לאורבות בתי שימוש, מאות בתי כנסת. היהודים נצטרכו לטרטר חובות בטליתות התפילה, לשרוף ספרי קודש ולרקוד סביב המדורות, וכל המחזות הללו צולמו לפרסום בשטירמר ובעיתונות הנאצית. באותו זמן החל שוד רכוש, שאורגן בדרכים שונות של קנסות קיבוציים, חרמת דירות, לידים סתם גזל בתירוץ של שיפוץ אחרי נשק, שאפשר לחטוף דבר בעל ערך ולהסתלק. החלה פרשת חטיפות לעבודה. נחטפו גברים מהעוברים ושבים ברחובות. אדם היה יוצא בבוקר ולא ידע אם יחזור לביתו לאט ערב. אחדים היו חוזרים ובידם כרחוב עבודה. אחרים לא חזרו. והגרמנים הסבירו כי הללו נשלחו לעבודה מחוץ לעיר. הם לא נראו עוד בעולם. אנשי האס-אס היו פורצים לשכונות יהודיות ומכות מכריחים את היהודים לצאת לעבודות שעצם ביצוען היה מכוון להשפיל. לפתוח בורות ולחסותם, להעביר אבנים ולהחזירם. היהודים הפכו לעדת מפחדים, מושפלים ומוקעים, חסרי כל זכויות אדם. בתי התפילה נסגרו. הפעילות הציבורית נפסקה, מקורות הפרנסה עצמם. אולם זו הייתה לעת התארה חטופה 
what for the time being the period of minor terror. The tragedy and destruction of Polish Jewry was yet to come. The Heidrich instructions of September 21, 1939 with regard to the treatment of the Jews have already been mentioned in connection with the planning of the Holocaust. The first part of these instructions given in cooperation with the Jews to Einsatzgruppen involved the identification and concentration of the Jews as intermediate steps towards the final solution. This concentration it was not very difficult to Hitler, Göring, the Keitel, issued orders on October 7, 1939 for the establishment of separate areas for Germans in the East, from which other ethnic groups were to be removed. Hitler was given almost unlimited powers. Implementation of this grave was devolved on the security police. Chief Heydrich gave the following order on December 12, 1939. In important reasons, make the central handling of all police and security matters connected with the execution of the evacuation in the eastern areas necessary. I have therefore appointed SS Hauptsturmführer Eichmann, deputizing for SS Hauptsturmführer Günther, as my special representative in the Reichsicherheit Hauptamt Bureau 4. The objectives of the section were defined in a detailed document describing the aims of German policy in the areas of Poland and to the right. These aims included the deportation of all the population who could not be restored to the bosom of the German people by a process of Germanization and the resettlement of the whole area by the Germans. The Jews to be deported as swiftly as possible, and all their rights cancelled. The task of making the detailed plans and carrying out the deportations devolved upon the accused, Eichmann, who was also sent forth his function into Raya to carry out Himmler's orders for the deportation of all the Jews from what was called the Ostrau. From then on, Eichmann operated in the East in the name of the Reichsführer himself and with his authority. In September 1939, orders were also carried out with regard to organized plunder of Jewish property, confiscation of their factories and warehouses, and after that pillage of whatever came to hand. In addition, they began to impose financial levies on the Jewish communities, simply according to whim. In October 1939, an Eastern Trustee Authority, Stelle Ost, was set up to handle the plundered property, with a head office in Berlin and branches in a number of the leading Polish cities. Himmler issued regulations for cooperation with this authority, which was given unlimited rights to confiscate Polish and Jewish property. In January 1940, we already find a representative of the Freuhans Stiller Ost present at a meeting to deal with the deportation presided over by Eichmann. At this meeting, there was a discussion on the methods used so far to carry out the deportations 
to the area of the government general, and it was reported that in one transport a hundred men had frozen to death. It was decided that at an early date about 350,000 Jews would be deported from the Vartagal area, which included Lodz and Poznan, to the military government area in coordination with Frank's government. The only property the Jew would would be allowed to take with him would be 100 Polish Zlotis. Reports on each transport were to be submitted to police headquarters in Krakow and to Adolf Eichmann. At a meeting of the administration of the government general, this movement was described as a modern migration of peoples. And two years later, Frank was to describe this operation as follows. Quotes. Then came the fantastic transfer of hundreds of thousands of Jews and Poles to the government general. You will recall the terrible months during which freight trains fully loaded with people rolled in day by day. There were trucks filled to overflowing with corpses. This was a terrible time when every district chief, every local and municipal officer had to chase around from morning to night to get rid of this influx of these elements who had become unwanted in the life and whom they had suddenly decided to shift. All this we had to endure. Unquote. What the victims of that dreadful journey had to endure Blood, suffering and torment, how they fell by the wayside with their little ones, how they dragged through the mud and snow. Of all this, of course, Frank had nothing to say. This deportation encompassed about half a million people and was carried out by a special RHSA department, 4D4, headed by Adolf Eichmann. Included also in this deportation program were the Jews of East Russia, East Prussia. Finally, in view of Frank's protest, that the transport gave him and his assistants too heavy a load of work, Goering ordered on March 23, 1940, that there should be no more deportations to the area of the government general without Frank's prior consent. In the meantime, the concentration of the Jews in Poland and the plunder of their property continued in accordance with the master plan of 1939. Ghettos were established in the worst districts of the cities where it was quite impossible to maintain hygiene. The inhuman overcrowding and filth soon produced severe epidemics. To leave the ghetto meant public execution. The ghetto itself became an instrument of extermination. Let us listen to an authentic description. On Yom Kippur 1940, the radio announced the German order for the setting up of the Jewish quarter in the city of Warsaw. Within a few days, the Jews had to leave their homes outside and to enter the quarter without being told into which part they were to go. Thus about 100,000 Jews entered the Jewish quarter, which was already overcrowded. They became refugees, carrying their worldly goods by hand or on a cart, wandering through the streets, stopping at the house, standing confused, not knowing where to go. At that time, the ghetto was still open, and there was contact with the outside world. It was still possible to go to work outside the Jewish quarter. After a short while, and without previous notice, the Jewish quarter was isolated and walled off, and German or Polish police stationed at every gate or exit. All at once, the ghetto was cut off from its sources of livelihood, from places of work, and from all possibility of obtaining essential commodities and its inhabitants felt that prison walls had closed in upon them.
באותה תקופה הובאו לבית אומר שעוד עשרות אלפי יהודים מערי השדה הצרפתי. הללו קיבלו פקודה לחסל את סגיהם תוך שעתיים, לקחת עמהם מה שיכולים לשאת בידיהם ועל גבם, והובלו כולם ברגל לתוך הגטו בוורש. בדרך כל מי שנכשל או מעדה רגלו, מי שנאנח ונעצר רגע, נורא ומת. שוב הוכנס לגטו זרם פליטים, שוב נראו אנשים עומדים או יושבים ברחובות הגטו ללא קורת גג או מזון, מחכים לתושייה. החיים בגטו הפכו מהינום ללא נסוף, צפיפות איומה שררה בו, עשרות נפשות בכל חדר. התנאים הסניטריים גרועים, ובתוך כך המגפות והמחלות. חוסר אפשרות עבודה, פרט למפעלי העבדות של הגרמנים, השגת מצרכי מזון, הביא במהרה את הרעב. משפחות שלמות של יהודים, על נשותיהם וילדיהם, נראו יושבות על מדרכות הרחובות נפוחים מרעב. בשעות העוצר, כששקט השתרר ברחובות, נשמעו מכל עבר קולות ילדים רכים המבקשים פרוסת לחם, אשתיקה לברויט. והדבר היחידי שאפשר היה לתת להם היו פירורים שיהודים רחמנים נתנו. בבוקר נמצאו על המדריכות ליד השערים גופות אנשים, בעיקר של ילדים, מוטלות כשהן מכוסות בנייר. כי במשך הלילה גם הלבוש נמכר. המצב הקשה ביותר היה כמובן בין הפליטים שהגיעו מערי הסביבה, כי אפשר היה למצוא עבורם מקום פנוי בתוך הגטו. הם רומזו בבתי פליטים, ובית כזה לא ניתן היה אפילו לעבור, כי לא נשאר שטח בלתי תפוס על ידי אדם. הם ניזונו על ידי צלחת מרק ופרוסת לחם היום. מדי יום ביומו נקברו מאות יהודים. כל בוקר רצו היהודים המוצבים לעבודה במפעלים הכלכליים שיסדו הגרמנים, בתקווה שתודות לעבודתם יצילו חייהם. רבים לא הספיקו להגיע לבתי המלאכה, כי הגרמנים היו נכנסים לתוך הגטו, מתייצבים באמצע הרחוב, מתחילים לירות. היהודים אינם יודעים מהיכן נשקפת להם סכנה, מתקהלים בדרך כלל במקום אחד. אז היו אנשי האס-אס סוגרים את הרחובות, אוספים אותם במקום אחר, מובילים אותם לאומשלג, ומקום השילוח לגירושים. תמיד בהסוואה, כאילו בודקים את כרטיסי העבודה. אחדים אפילו שוחררו בגלל עבודתם. היו מחזות קורלה. הנה תפסו יהודי ויש לו כרטיס עבודה, אבל את ילדיו לוקחים ממנו. והוא מתחנן ללכת עם ילדיו, אך אין מניחים לו. לזקנים ולחולים מעמידים עגלות, והללו היו נראים עם צרורותיהם הדלים, בנסיעה ברחוב לדרכם האחרונה. במשך כל תקופת הגירושים לא פסק הטרור בתוך הגט. בתירוץ של התנגדות כביכול, היו הורגים עשרות יהודים למען עידו ועיראק. היו אנשי אס-אס שתפסו ילדים קטנים וניפצו ראשיהם על אבני המדריכה. רבו המקרים אשר היה נדמה כי חוץ מפעולת הגירוש, ישנם גרמנים המתעללים ביהודים ממש מתוך חדוות התעללות. עם גבור הרעב, פיתחו אנשי האס-אס שיטה חדשה. הם הודיעו שכל מי שיתנדב לגירוש, יקבל לדרך שלושה קילוגרם לחם וקילו ריבה. ואכן נמצאו רבים, שחרפת הרעב שלא יכלו לסיתה עוד, אילצה אותם להתייצב בעצמם מרצונם במקום הגירוש. שוב נראו שיירות של יהודים עם מטלטליהם וילדיהם בידיהם נעים לעבר האום שלגבלץ. 
Unquote. One of the first ghettos was set up in Lodz, Litzmannstadt. Where 160,000 persons were crowded together in an area of four square kilometers. People lived six to a room. In the first year and a quarter, about 15,000 of them died. In spite of the terrible conditions, Eichmann pushed into the city another 20,000 Jews and 5,000 gypsies from the Reich. The district commissioner complained to Himmler himself that Eichmann had apparently given incorrect facts with regard to the capacity of the ghetto which was being swept by epidemics. He compared Eichmann's methods with those of gypsies at a horse market. When he wrote this on October 9, 1941, he did not know that the decision had already been taken to exterminate all the Jews and it did not matter by what methods this end would be achieved. In the fateful summer of 1941, ideas and plans for the extermination of the Jews were being mooted in Germany. Eichmann's representative in Poznan, Sturm van Führer Hepner, wrote a personal letter to the accused in which Israeli had suggested that all the Jews from the Wartegaard area, about 300,000 members, should be concentrated in a place where they could work in the coal mine. He knew that in this way he would overcome the danger of epidemics that existed in long and other ghettos, and also get control of the and this camp, all the Jewish women were to finish off the Jewish in this generation. He added, and I quote, there is a danger that this winter we shall be unable to feed all the Jews. It is worth considering seriously whether it would not be the most humane solution to finish off the Jews in so far as they are not fit for work and to put the method at all events that would be more pleasant than to watch them die of hunger. Unquote. In the accompanying letter, Hefner writes that possibly his proposals seemed fantastic, but they were practical. Apparently, he did not know that the agreed to which plans of this kind had been prepared for implementation as part of the general solution. In the summer of 1943, Eichmann came to the large ghetto and there, after consultation with those concerned, the conclusion was reached that the ghetto was no longer worth maintaining. It was decided that it should be turned into a concentration camp in which only persons fit for work would be left. The others would be sent off. Another method used by the Gestapo to liquidate Polish Jewelry was that of the labor camps. Early in the second month after the conquest, all Polish Jews between the ages of 14 and 16 were told to register for work. They were ordered to carry out the most difficult assignments under a regime of blows and severe physical punishment. In the eight men began to collect because the effort of them exceeded human strength. According to the report of the Polish government committee for the investigation of Nazi crimes in Poland, there were more than 300 such labor camps. Prisoners built roads, set up fortifications, diverted streams, and worked in factories, quarries, and so forth. In the ghettos also, labor duty was the general rule. Evidence was brought as to living conditions in such a camp. In Plasho, near Krakow, the days were stopped at 4 a.m. and it was late at night. 
המגורים וצריפים, וכל צריף כמה מאות אנשים ששכבו על דרגשים בשלוש קומות. כל העבודות בוצעו בהרצה מתמדת. המפגר היה סופג עשרים וחמש מלכות על גוף ארוך. האוכל מעט לחם. There was a little bread. Twice a day a drink that was cold and coffee, a week soup at midday, and at times a little bit. The inmates were always hungry, but it was forbidden to get food in from outside, and violators of this rule were shot or hanged. At times a whole group would be punished for this offense. Very often mass beatings would be carried out on the parade ground.